dashboard. Um, and we're trying to focus more on uh, kind of, it's clear where you should be going in the front end. Um, so kind of highlighting buttons more. Where are you, are you showing this on the screen? Uh, I'm working on pulling it up right yeah, now. Uh, okay. um, sorry. Well, let me see if there's a good instance. I would have, uh, would have had this pulled up before, but I didn't know that Sean wasn't going to be able to make it. And I don't think he knew he wasn't going to be able to make it till okay. about 15 minutes ago. I'm going to go to the channels. I can go oh, okay. Here. Uh, I'm so pulling it. CZF.OSS Health. Uh, there we go. Okay. There we go. Now we got something to work with. Okay, and so there is clearly one issue with the uh, smaller charts down there right now. Um, but as you can see with the with the upper charts, uh, we're trying to make make it clear the date range that the insight was discovered on and. Um, now the current metric that the insight was discovered on is in that little uh, blip in the top right of the chart. Yep. And, okay. and we have a scale on the y-axis too to kind of make things clear. Um, and once we resize those charts in the lower section, um, that will look a lot cleaner as well. But we have little titles that show the uh, metric name where there is an in, where there is a significant insight for these repos down here and so you can kind of see from a surface level okay so in this in so this repo group we have uh, a couple of new issue insights um three out of the five most significant uh and try to give that kind of insight on the whole organization like where like which repositories are get, are getting what kind of activity. So let me ask a question here. So why are you guys choosing, say for Chaos Augur versus Vega versus Boca? Oh, okay, yeah, so, so why, I know why you have those, but why are you choosing like 32 days versus 10 days versus 53 days? as your, so, your range. So this will eventually be customizable, but right now for insight detection, we are uh, declaring what is normal based off of the past year of data points. And we are only logging insights within the past 90 days. So that's why any insight that you're gonna see is going to be built up of data points within the past 90 days. And that's where the insight will be. In. Does that answer your question? Sort of. I mean, not really. So like, if you say, if you look at chaos auger, it says the repository has a sharp increase in reviews in the past 32 days. Right. So the, that is identifying an anomaly across a 32 day window or a third of the time period versus Vega. It says in the past 10 days, Right. So, so maybe you answer it and I just didn't understand it. Okay. Yeah. So these sentences maybe could be a little bit more clear on that. So what, what it's meaning is that the insight occurred 32 days ago. So 32 days ago, there was a sharp increase in reviews. So, I see. Um, and for Vega, so 10 days ago, they had an increase in new issues. So, so maybe yes, right. that, that definitely should be a little clearer. Yeah. Yeah, because the way it read, reads now, it's like a win, some window time frame. Not <laughs> right. Yeah. No, that's a great point. Okay. Um, and then the rendering on the smaller graphs, is that fairly straightforward to take care of? And that is very straightforward to take and actually it is uh, pulled up on our local instances, uh, but it is not pushed yet uh, towards the, these deployed instances. So okay. that's why on this particular one, it's just a little wonky. So um, on the CZI box right in the middle there, 
where it says like Altair, Seaborn, yeah. Altair, Vega, mm -hmm. all those. So it says code changes. So what that's telling me is there was probably an anomaly associated with each one of those repositories. One for Seaborn, the anomaly was associated with commit count. With Altair, the anomaly was associated with issues. Is that right? Right. Yeah, that's correct. So what's outside of the parentheses is the endpoint name, the endpoint or metric name. And within the parentheses is the specific field uh, that the insight was discovered on or the anomaly. Um, so, and okay. So would I be able to click on, say, Altair? Altair. And get um, some insight Yes. Like so, when that anomaly actually occurred? Um, so in, in order to get some insight on specific anomalies, uh, we, we have that capability for these top insights up here uh, yeah. to view the full report. Um, and so for those smaller ones, um, we have it on, it, it's a task that we're planning to do to uh, make it so you can click on these specific charts. Yeah. And then go to a page that would in, be inspecting an insight like this one. Is right, because the insights at the top are helpful in the sense that they point me to a date that yeah. the anomaly actually occurred. The insights, the smaller insights, don't actually like if I go if you go back. Yeah. You probably know what I'm saying, but like the smaller graphs, the insights, they don't really. They tell me that there was something associated with whatever issue, new issues. Mm hmm. For say Altair, like down in the CZI box in the middle there. Yeah. But they don't really tell me what when that anomaly occurred. Like I would just look at that and be like, there was an anomaly somewhere in the last 90 days. Yeah, yeah, and that's totally valid. And uh, kind of the idea we were initially going for was to be able to fit kind of a snippet of repos out of all your uh, repo groups and be able to see a little bit about it. And these charts are kind of meant you to drive you to dive deeper okay and uh kind of inspect these things or go to this specific repo yeah so i can understand what that insight is about right yeah so that's kind of the goal but um would would you recommend more information maybe on these smaller no i mean honestly just clicking if i could just click on the chart itself or click on that the row that is Altair or the row that is Vega and then take me to something that showed me more information, that's fine. Okay, I see. Yeah, yeah, that is a good point. And to, to go to this Inspect Insight page. I mean, actually even, maybe even more user-friendly would be just hovering above the chart would bring up a box that says, this repository had a sharp increase in code changes 10 days ago. Oh yeah, that's actually a really nice idea. Because then they don't actually leave this page, but they can get the information. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, that's definitely something. I don't know how well you got, how good you guys are with, I Zoom JavaScript? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we, we have that ability. Uh, so kind of a tool like tip, kind of like these right here. Yep, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. That's a great idea. Thank you. Um, and yeah, kind of the idea is, yeah, we're just making, uh, trying to make steps in the right direction to make the front end more user friendly and kind of make sense. And I got a a uh, small, so if you click on repos over on the left side. Yeah. If you, I was getting a funny behavior the other day. I didn't open an issue either. <laughs> if this opens. 
Hmm. Maybe yeah, it seems like we're getting some funny behavior too. Yep. <laughs> Always goes that way with my demos. Maybe uh, it's in the cache. So basically, or click on repo groups. Try that. Nada. Um, it should be working. I don't know why all of a sudden it's not. What's our other one? Andy, we were just talking about some UI things just to get the. Awesome. I see some changes from last week. So yeah. Just, yeah. Just in order to easier ways to kind of express the insights for people in consistent ways. So anyway, the behavior was um, when I would see the list of repos, you know, it would be like, oh, there you go. So click on, just click, I don't care, click on any one of those. All right, so it's already not doing what I was having. So I would click on it and it would take me back to that list page. And then I would click on it a second time. And then it would take me to this page. Oh, okay. I think I've experienced what you're talking about too. It's um, kind of like it just reloads the page. I don't know what yeah. it is. Okay, yeah, that's definitely something to look into. I think that's uh, maybe some weird behavior if it gets interrupted in the middle of of a different process or something. But that's something to look into for sure. We'll get that taken care of. Yep. And not sure what this was. Okay. Um, we have Jessica on the line too. So nothing, you guys, you're spinning circles right now. Um, I was going to ask if, if you had questions, Jessica, like on risk stuff. While we're here. Um, not right at the moment, Okay. but I'm sure, I'm sure I will as I get a little bit more, uh, right back in. Okay. So, I mean, uh, speaking of risk stuff, I actually think that um, over the weekend, I did see something, Sean was, or either Sean or Matt Snell was working on some of the, um, some of those risk metrics. Do you remember seeing that as well? Or am I just imagining things? Um, I wasn't really oh, Matt, Matt was working on, so Jessica, can you see the screen, Jessica? Yes, I can. Go back, you guys, to the yeah. risk one. So one of the things that I know Matt Snell is working on in the licenses declared box, he's getting rid of that note column and he's adding a link to the TLDR license text. Oops, sorry. So like the, um, like is it a TLDR that he's written or is it just like a- Oh, it's a account? site. Oh, sweet. So the reason is I don't know if you've, if you've all seen this. I just put it uh, in. Well, we figured out why the CZF instance went down. Uh, it's not our fault. <laughs> we'll leave it at that. So I just put in the chat the TLDR legal. So he's going to start, he's creating a cross reference document at the moment. And so where appropriate. This is what he's got uh, on, yeah. his, on his branch of oh, voice. Right. There we go. The screen's not, the screen's being funny. I'll pull up that link as well, Matt. I'm very interested in seeing this. The TLDR legal. So this is where he's getting the. Oh, yeah, so he's, just gonna start, he's just gonna cross reference. Yeah. And start pointing to these. So if you just click on any of those licenses. Click on YouTube Terms of Service. Go, go, don't do terms of service. Go oh, back. Yeah. yeah, I don't actual license, you're right. So we yeah. do that. That's fine. The Apache. So there. It's just a quick summary of the. This is actually, this is actually really helpful. I might bookmark this for my own personal use because sometimes I get confused about it. It's been around for a while and um, it might, it just could provide a little bit more insight. So that's what yeah. he's doing in terms of describing how the license was found. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. And um, I like the clarification. And now that I have, I'm sorry, I'm also trying to eat a very delayed lunch. Um, <laughs> Now that I've actually had a first bite of that and can think beyond how hungry I was, um, <laughs> can we go back to the, the, um, the yeah. <laughs> I'll help you. <laughs> <I can. laughs> Whatever the opposite of hangry is when you just can't think properly. Um, <laughs> so this isn't all of the risk metrics, is it? Um, it's, no, I no, believe no, elephant factor is not in here. Oh, the elephant factor? Yeah. This, I think, is... It's close, though. Yes. This Have is... you seen it on this page before, Matt? No. Oh, okay. it's never... I was just answering Jessica's question, whether or not these were all the risk metrics. Yeah. No, yeah, I know Matt Snell and has... Coverage isn't in there. Well, because yeah. I think we had, like, 10, 10 or 12 or something. Am I... Yeah, Six, seven. <laughs> okay, so I'm remembering improperly. Or we are going to start with six and then and then move forward. I yeah. just want to make sure, like, because I, I know when um, we had the previous auger instance, which uh -huh. if I can pull it up, I will. There were there were quite a few more, so I just want to make sure I'm understanding what the scope of this particular version of it is going to be. Okay, I I can't answer that. You guys okay. might. Because here's this is just the one that I've been looking at previously, and I know that that's been um, that was a, let's call it a prototype. Sure. Oh, it looks like it's the oh yes, the old version, old old version. Yeah, this that's is partially my own fault because I haven't been able to make the the risk calls, mm -hmm. <laughs> but I just want to make sure I understand how the two efforts are working together. Mm -hmm. I think there, there was. A the information that's at the so the information that's at the bottom, Jessica, that starts with the of code added by cup and authors visualized. Yeah. That go back. So, oh, here. Yeah. There we go. So the one that Jessica, that, oh, my bad. That information is available. So it's, okay. it doesn't happen to be on this risk page. But that could be possibly linked off of this risk page. Yeah, so, that can certainly be added onto dire directly onto it. Well, but these aren't necessarily risk metrics. Okay. But, but this information is available, so mm -hmm. that has not been deleted. Yeah. And then what you're seeing? What the bring up the current current risk pages. These are the actual risk metrics as defined in the chaos project. So forks, committers, CII, license coverage down in the bottom right there, the different licenses declared, mm -hmm. and the ability to produce a software bill of materials. And so the only thing that's not on here, there's two things that aren't on this page at the moment that were part of the chaos release. One is test coverage. I don't know what you guys are doing in that regard. I uh, don't think we have any. Do we have any metrics for test coverage? I don't, I don't. That's not something we've looked into, so we don't have anything. But that's definitely something that we could okay. look into. Okay. And then the other is um, elephant factor. Okay. And that one actually, with that, the data that is at the bottom of the one that you have. You know that old, the old version. Mm -hmm. That could be determined mm -hmm. fairly straightforward. Okay, and then if you guys, if you scroll back up um, and Which click one? into the evolution, t so I guess the, that would answer my own question. Is then like so the stats that didn't show up on the evolution tab would be under an equivalent page yeah. for evolution metrics. Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And we actually, at one point, we did have the calculation for, um, we had it for bus factor. Is bus factor the same as elephant factor? Elephant factor is just by company as opposed oh, to by, by company. company. Okay. So it's well, the same calculation. Right. Well, actually, I think with, with some of the, um, 
so that's actually something that we actually, uh, so we have the ability now to map, uh, I, th I think Sean has talked about this before, have the ability to map people between um, contributor aliases, like with companies and their emails and uh, their GitHub IDs. Um, so now that we have that ability, we can actually start looking at, by company, calculating those elephant factors. Um, that's something that we couldn't do before and that we have the capability to do now. And since we already, at one point, had the, the, the calculation for it, I think it would be a simple matter of just adding in the, the my company and we could produce that metric. Yep. I should write that down before I forget. So can I ask another thing just for, um, let's call it ease of usability for non, <laughs> I'm a policy person mostly. So I'll use myself as the example. Um, so if I wanted to say like, if OpenSSL is the one that I have sort of top of mind. So if I wanted to have, obviously I can look at the, the risk metrics for OpenSSL. Um, if I go up a level, can I see all the metrics? Is there like a, let's call it a home page for a given software repository that then I can then go, okay, I want to see the risk metrics and I want to see the evolution metrics and I want to see the diversity metrics. Is that all like linked somewhere together? Or are these still technically separate from one another? Uh, well, yes, we do have a repo overview page. Um, and I hope this instance is back up and working. Um, but yes, we do have a repo overview page that kind of has a little bit of everything. Um, and so I know from the old version, we have a couple of these charts on there. Uh, so we have this lines of code added uh, visualization on there. Uh, and I know we have these two as well. Can we you not bring it this up? chart. Sorry? Can you not bring it up in the new? Um, okay, this instance is back up. Yes, I can. And so we plan on putting some risk metrics on this page too. But I think to Jessica's point, so the way that chaos is structured, as you guys know, is like evolution, risk, value, um, DNI. Yeah. And so like right now, if I look at the top, like right where the white meets the gray, mm -hmm. it says auger and then the URL, and then it says risk. Mm -hmm. And so like I can click on that risk button and get the, the risk metrics. Mm -hmm. And so if I was to go back, would it make sense to have an evolution button and a value button? Yes, yeah, it's definitely something we're interested in to have pages tailored to specific working groups within chaos. But like you guys were, you were doing that in the old design anyway. So what, what, like the, the, the site that Jessica shared. Yeah. You go back to that. Yeah. With our tabs up top. Yeah. It had the tabs, which are basically evolution. And for a while you had like evolution, DNI, value, risk. Yeah. And if I remember correctly, well, no, I know we weren't trying to stray from the working group model, but as of right now, we were trying to just start off with a more general overview type feel, but... Um, Which is the, that's like the facade. If you go back, that doesn't seem to be loading. No, no, like go back. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's like this is the general overview mm -hmm. of people. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, is Matt, maybe can I, um, can I, I'll maybe give my perspective and sort of where I'm thinking of in the user base that I'm envisioning. Yeah. That, yeah. that might help frame the problem. So as Matt has heard ad nauseum, I do a lot of work with the medical device community. Mm -hmm. um, and the way that I've been talking to the medical device community, like global product security officers, who are looking at connected drug infusion pumps or connected whatever it may be, um, 
they are looking at this as sort of a, I have several products that I can buy. I want to be able to compare these products to each other, the security or the evolution metrics or whatever of these different products. So I know which one is the best value for my organization and I know which one is the most secure. Um, so from their perspective, because they're not gonna be familiar with chaos in 99% of cases, they're not gonna be looking at this from a perspective of, okay, I wanna look at the evolution metrics. Okay, I wanna look at the value metrics. I wanna look at the risk metrics. It's just gonna be kind of a, a thing to them. They just, they're just our metrics. Um, and so I think for them, if there's some kind of, that's why I ask about a home page. If they, if they know that the products that they're looking at contains OpenSSL and Lodash and you know however many other packages are in it, I think the way that they're gonna wanna look at it is to be able to go to OpenSSL home page and then just kind of start clicking around and looking at things they're going to want to go to lodash's home page and start clicking around and looking at things so i don't i don't know if that's a design decision that would be helpful for you all if you want to target this more to people who are familiar with the chaos project itself or software development a little bit more specifically or you want to have in the additional use case of um people who might need a more generalized view who are going to use it in that that slightly different way in, in like kind of a more exploratory way, am I? Yeah. That? Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a great viewpoint to have, um, or for, for us to uh, consider. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I guess so. Kind of us giving you the metrics that we think you should be looking at, sort of, kind of in a in an overview type layout, like you were saying, kind of all there for you to kind of scroll through and just look around. Yeah, because a lot of these, these organizations are all going to have unique um, policies and procedures. Some people might be able to have a little bit more tolerance for risk than others. Some, I know of one medical device, or not medical device company, but a hospital, for example, who makes it a contract um, requirement that you can't use any open source package in a medical device that you're providing them that hasn't been updated in more than a year. So they need to be able to tell at a glance when was the last time that this particular pro project was updated. And so it's just, it's things like that where people have specific um, requirements or questions or things that, you know, are important for them in their organization. I think, you know, I think this could be very valuable for them to be a very quick way for them to tell whether or not a given project or package or something meets their own internal requirements. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. Yeah, thank you so much for, for that perspective. Yeah. Jessica, do you, do you know what those things might be? I mean, or is it just, are they kind of the, really just the highlights driven from the chaos metrics? Um, I know the, the ones that we've put into the risk ones are yeah. the ones that I've heard come up the most, which is why they became the risk metrics. Yep. But um, the, which is why I was actually asking about the, um, how many were actually gonna be going into risk. Cause I, I think we didn't include like how long it takes issues to get it resolved or how many issues exist, how many issues get resolved in the original deployment of the risk metrics. But I, I know that's a big one. Um, I mean, I'd have to kind of go through it and, and take a look, but like it's, it's things like that. Uh, can't can't use an open source package that hasn't been updated in more than a year. Like I know that right. one's becoming bigger. Okay. I mean those two that I'm yeah. Okay, that that's fair. Those two that you mentioned, I know that Carter, I mean, I know that you guys have that data. Yeah. Yeah. Which is issue resolution time, whether it's closed or mer or closed, I guess. Right. Or issues. And then an issue resolution may be attached to a merged pull request um, and then commits. No, those are the other thing um, that I might be able to do, this is, this is not a promise, but um, yeah. I've got a couple people on tap. Like um, there's a CISO at a hospital, the one that I was mentioning. Uh -huh. um, there's a couple of global product security officers at medical device companies where if I can actually give them something to look at, they might then be able to say, I want this, 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 and this, this is not important to me. This is less important. But um, in that case, I'm going to need like as much information as we can give them. So then, then they can come back and say, 
I, yes, these metrics, these metrics are less important, et cetera. So that's not saying that you need to like fully revamp um, what you're doing. Like this is, this is very helpful. But one of the reasons why I continue to use um, the, the old version of Augur is that there's so much data immediately and there, there's so many graphs that it gives people a lot to look at and sort of say, okay, this is helpful, this is not. Right, yeah. Okay, yeah, that's a great point. Um, and we will definitely look to be adding as much as possible for the hopes of an opportunity like that. That sounds like something that would be really helpful to us mm -hmm. to be maybe able to the, it to those use cases. Mm -hmm. Maybe part of the roadmap, do you, where, where the old kind of the old auger instance that you have so that's still running some somewhere yeah and i was unaware of that yeah actually i don't i don't think sean took that domain down we don't use it for no, i might not have taken it down because he knew that i was using it <laughs> yeah yeah but i mean honestly you guys can you if you click on that old one if you click on the evolution tab Ooh, yeah, that's the one. Yeah. I mean, maybe part of the request, maybe it's not that complicated in terms of what Jessica's asking for, but basically what I, I think what it comes down to is see all these, put them in the new UI. Yeah. <laughs> that's the, I think that's the, mm -hmm. that's the takeaway. Mm -hmm. Part of, you know, I don't know how hard it is to, Clearly, this data is being pulled from somewhere. Yeah. And obviously, there's a statement written. I don't even know if it's a statement written off of the new schema. These? This yeah. Is, uh, this is definitely pointing to the old schema, or to the old uh, data sources. OK. Yeah, th these are coming from GH torrent, mm -hmm. most likely. But I mean, like if you look at these, issue closed issues per week. I mean, those are that's a pretty straightforward sequel, right? Yeah, we have the endpoints to provide those. Videos. Yeah, I said, yeah, you have the API endpoints. I think for all of these, don't you? Yeah, we do. We do. So how hard? How hard is it? Like that seems like that's not that hard to query to get this data. How hard is it to work with view to get that data into a graph? It's not difficult. We have just had limited resources when it comes to working on the front end mm -hmm. uh, in the recent months, just with how fast our our back end and data collection uh, structure has been changing. Because mm -hmm. first and foremost, we wanted the endpoints available. Yeah. Um, and now we're moving into the UX stuff and trying to optimize that and get all these visualizations up there. Are you guys, do either of you guys, Carter or Gabe, are you guys good with Vue? I'm not familiar with it at all. Yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty much our only, <laughs> our only front end developer at this point. For now. For now. For now. All right. So maybe, I mean, I don't, I know that you're working with Sean too, but maybe the easy, one of the easiest ways to think about this is taking a look at this page right here. Because I'm with you, I think all the API endpoints have been created mm -hmm. and getting them into a view graph. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And then that could be on that front page. And then you yeah, could still yeah. have the risk tab. Mm -hmm and the value tab and all, and all of the, the different groupings. Yeah, exactly. And, and have that too, that, cause a lot of people really like that a lot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, <laughs> so guys, what, what JavaScript library, um, are you using to generate these graphs? Uh, Vigo light. Vigo light. Yeah. Yeah. We can put that in the chat. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then what are you using to sort of manage the boxes on screen? Is that, is that view? Uh, 
we are using it's actually part of this dashboard collection uh, that we're building the new front end with. Uh, it's just some raw HTML and some comes with that dashboard that I'll put the name in the chat. It's called shards dash view. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, and we definitely know that there's some of the stuff that looks pretty funky, like the, the graphs that were kind of overlapping earlier. And then I know the one, I think it might be the individual repo page where it's got all those graphs that are like on top of each other. Um, that was on the old instance. Oh, this is the new Oh, this is the new one? Oh, even page. better. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we're working on making it more dynamic to the screen size because we're working on laptops where lots of community managers are and other people in this community are using bigger monitors and things like that. So we're trying to make it more dynamic. Mm -hmm. And we, we do actually have somebody who's been working on like making the, the formatting look correct and the styling for different sizes. That, that work is not live yet, but it, it has been happening. Okay. Well, well, personally, I'll tell you, I think these graphs look gorgeous. They're spectacular. Thank you. Thank um, you. I, do, I do have maybe um, a suggestion about approach that you might consider. Okay. One is um, make your screen a, a fixed width screen and, and you'll just save yourself a whole ton of, of complexity by, by dynamically resizing the, the page, you know, uh, back and forth. So that's, that's one suggestion. Another suggestion is, um, you know, you might want to just create, um, it seems to me, I'm not sure, but it, it seems to me like you're, you're trying to create kind of a generic toolkit that where you can move things around and, and adjust and, and so on. Uh, maybe it would be worthwhile just creating a couple of fixed demo pages that weren't configurable, but just exactly address the needs of the audience like, like Jessica was talking about. That might, be, that might be a way of just reducing a lot of complexity and, you know, creating a, you know, kind of a benchmark that people can get their hands on and, and would love to start showing around. So just an idea. So is the idea there, Andy, just kind of getting the, uh, the catalog of metrics, whatever those might be for say OpenSSL and just saying, here's, here's how it looks for OpenSSL. Yeah, this is it and, it, and it's done. And, um, and let it be hard coded. You know, it doesn't have to be sort of dynamic and, and things of that nature. And then people could get it out, they could react to it, they could start, you know, sending feedback. So it's just an idea. So is it, it's kind of like even just disconnecting the front end from the back end in terms of dynamic. Just yeah, creating, the, creating dynamic displays for this type of UI, extremely difficult. I mean, there's, you know, there's huge teams that will spend, you know, man years figuring out how to make things you know, scale dynamically and, you know, uh, many, many different varieties of, of graphs. Uh, so I think it's awesome to have that as an ambition, but as a, as a first step, maybe you just, maybe just got, have got some hard coded demos and then, um, you know, people can, can give feedback on that. And um, that could be something like, for example, you know, that, that could be published sort of live on the, on the chaos website, that, that sort of thing. Yep. So just, just an idea. Yeah. Thank you. Andy. Mm. We just want to get something out the door for right now. We'll but the, the charting library itself that you picked is spectacular. I mean, that's, that's killer. You know, the, the various types of graphs that you've shown are awesome. Thank you. Yeah, I agree. Even I understand it, and I don't know JavaScript. <laughs> so you know it's good. I had I had another question. Is, is it? If, yeah, if you go ahead. Mind. Uh, I'm curious. Um, you have developed a a really comprehensive set of Python uh, code to extract data from third party systems and to load it into the database. 
I'm curious, would it be possible to run that code from the command line? Could I, could I sit there and like with a wrapper or a script, you know, just execute these things one by one? It is actually, yes, but you have to have the main instance of Augur running mm -hmm. to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and that's because the workers need to connect to our broker and housekeeper entities, which basically just manage the job of task renewal and sending out tasks to these workers, which are the data collection entities you're describing. Mm -hmm. um, and yes, so to answer your question, yes, there's uh, specific commands to start each worker from the command line. I believe it's, it's the name of the worker and then underscore start, right? Yeah, that's right. And, and that automatically gets created whenever you install a worker. Um, which will happen whenever you run the install script. So for it, it runs through all of those install files, um, and those commands are automatically created um, because of the way we have it set up. Oh, so it actually generates like bash scripts. It's not. A, it's it's done through the Python stuff. It actually or, installs each each um, worker as a Python package, mm -hmm. um, and then you can start it just by running the name of the package, which is like if I have the facade worker. Um, you could just, it, you have to go into that directory for the facade worker. Yeah. Uh, and then you would just type facade underscore start. Or hmm. facade nice. underscore worker. Yeah. My apologies. Whatever the name of the package is, whatever it is you're trying to run. And then that would automatically, um, automatically start it. As far as like command line utility and configuration options for like spending parameters, those aren't as well defined um, simply because we haven't had the time to sit down and define what each of those are for the workers. We must sure. have focused on getting the data collection portion of it, um, but we're we're starting. Actually, today we're having our, our first meeting of our uh, kind of our hardening phase, um, and and adding those things in the quality of life enhancers, if you will, um, being able to dynamically start and stop workers, pass in configurable parameters that we want, um, making and you know writing this all of this down, the whole process to do in like documentation that's easily accessible. Um, that, that effort's actually starting today. And hopefully by this call next week, we'll have some pretty pretty good progress on some, stuff, some of that stuff to, to share with everybody. Mm -hmm. And okay. actually some exciting things related to that that I'm working on currently is uh, being able to get these workers, uh, make it configurable for you to get them to start automatically when you run Augur. And so that's kind of meant to appeal to just the user experience kind of make everything easier uh, and act in a way where the user just has to say like, okay, I want this data for these repositories. Uh, and just to be able to configure that and the workers will get booted automatically just when you run Augur. They just gotta hit go. Yeah, exactly. And uh, another thing related to that, we, with that option where workers start automatically will also provide the ability for you to be able to spin up multiple instances of specific workers making data collection two, three, four times faster. How long does it take, if you could characterize like the, the, the runtime and the amount of CPU consumed for a particular worker, could you talk about that a little bit? Just, just what your observations are? Um, well, so I know some, it depends on the number of repos you're collecting data for. Like it's very dynamic and it depends like if those repos, if those repos are large or small, cause the size varies so much and the number of repos varies a ton too with mm -hmm. each of these instances. Mm -hmm. But like, like uh, the facade worker actually has to go download the data which takes a while. The GitHub worker it makes a lot of API calls, so it's it's you know it's using it's doing different stuff. Um, it it really does depend a lot on on each worker, and that's in the far 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 future. Um, that's something we want to be able to say actually to the user is when they start um, their data collection process. You know, based on how large the repos are and how many they've specified, 
we want to be able to give them like a, you know, it's gonna, it's approximately 15 minutes left or approximately 15 days left if they've specified all of Ruby on Rails, maybe. Um, mm. So it's, it's hard to say. Um, there, I mean, we've had instances of workers that are like have been running for like weeks at a time just because we've <clears throat> given them, you know, several hundred repositories to go churn through. Mm. And, and, that, and that just takes a long time because of the process of doing several hundred repositories. And we right. want to do these measures relatively soon so we can be able to recommend uh, like certain frequencies of the tasks to users, you know, like how often they want to be running certain workers to keep their data updated without it overlapping, mm -hmm. things like that. So we plan to do those measures. We don't have definitive ones. Uh, but I know in our main database that we do all our development on, it has around 2,000, maybe a little more, may, maybe closer to 2,500 repos now. And mm. they probably average out to be all like me, like an average medium sized repo. Uh, and I think the our issue collection worker for GitHub takes. 24 to 48 hours to process all of well actually um if it's doing a fresh run it'll it'll take like 24 to 48 hours but to keep that data updated from then on uh each pass of the worker will just take a couple hours because then it only has to collect data that it hasn't collected before mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh so that's that's running on a repo by repo basis, I guess. So if there was a if there was a failure, sort of midstream, you would just pick up on the on the repo that it failed on. Is that is that kind of how you look yeah. at it? Yeah, we have a error catching and logging. Mm -hmm. And and how much data do you reckon? Let's say after after you ingest from twenty five hundred repos, how big is that database? Very. It's pretty yeah. large. Yeah. I, I don't know the number. I honestly, I don't think I've ever looked. <laughs> I mean, that's I now now I'm curious. I mean, I can give you. I mean, what are you you curious about? Like the number of issues we have, or just like or, like like I can give you some rough numbers. Like I know the we have size, uh, like the memory size. I mean, we have millions of commits stored, um, mm -hmm. and you probably. Probably, yeah. Probably in the millions for issues too, maybe. At the, well, probably not millions. Yeah, probably not. But I mean, each repository, because we collect closed issues as well. So we're, I mean, it's a big database, yeah. So, so just in terms of just data size, is it like a gig or 10 gigs or what do you, what do you think? I what are magnitude? Give a, definitive answer that I'm confident on. I Sean would be a better person to ask for that. Mm -hmm. okay. I don't want to say anything that I'm not confident on. Well, it's, it's okay. <laughs> if you're wrong, it's not the end of the world. Well, I mean, I don't really know. I don't yeah. like have an idea is what I mean. Mm -hmm. Already. Okay. <laughs> well, we can definitely find out. Yes. Yeah, find out. Uh, uh, that'd be that'd be very interesting. Okay. Um, We're approaching the end. Yeah. Um, yeah. Really quickly, though, Matt, I, I just wanted to get at, um, some of your thoughts. So, I, as I mentioned earlier, we're starting some of the um, we're starting like the hardening process of, of making everything more robust and scalable and just easier to use. Um, mm -hmm. Since we've prioritized, I think we've talked about this before, prioritizing speed of development, just getting stuff up and working, and now we're gonna slow down a little bit and take some time to make it all look really pretty and, and function really yeah. really well and reliably. Um, as far as like new developer experience and, and documentation and, and things like that, you know, you and I talked a lot at, at ChaosCon about how to make the install script better. Mm -hmm. um, do you have off the top of your head any ideas about things that I should keep in mind and, and like make sure that I should do um, as work. I mean, I'm basically going to be 
rewriting almost all of our documentation um, from the ground up just to kind of a fresh start. Is there anything off the top of your head that you can think I should make sure to include or watch out for? I know it's kind of a very broad question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't mean to put you on the spot like that. Um, so I, I really, I'm a big fan of, see you later, Jessica. Um, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of the 10 minute rule. Mm -hmm. Or I think I said 15 minute rule in Slack. Mm -hmm. But from zero to install in 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. If you can't accomplish that, then people will leave. Mm -hmm. um, so I, honestly, I think you should time yourself or time students mm -hmm. doing an install. Mm -hmm. And I'm not joking. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> About that. I don't know if you have a pool of people to work with. Well, the software engineering students are going to be downloading Augur later in the semester, I think. So we'll have like 60 of them. <laughs> we yeah. plan on like handing out gift cards to people and uh, asking them to do specific things, kind of as some user testing, yeah. usability things, and how easy to follow is this documentation and certain things like that. Mm -hmm. um, so I know that different computers behave a little bit differently, but if you have uh, consistent behavior during the installs process, sometimes screenshots are extremely helpful and mm -hmm. they serve as a great point of reference for people mm -hmm. to know that they're doing right. Mm -hmm. So install scripts can be a little unnerving sometimes. Right. When you're eight steps in and things just keep going. <laughs> but yeah. You're sure if if the going is the right kind of going right um so giving people clear points of orientation as to what they should be seeing would be extremely helpful okay definitely i didn't even thought of that yeah that's a good point. Mm -hmm. that also means i have to make it look nice yeah and then you you know <laughs> yeah um so other things that at least we've done in the past on installs is um, I don't know how much uh, in the process you can automate it, but using language like, um, like, great, let's move on to the next step. Like helping people, because you're do it, you're at the command line. Mm -hmm. So having um, sometimes a conversational tone as to what they're supposed to do next helps a little bit. Yeah. I know it sounds silly, but. I don't know. I totally get it. Install complete with an exclamation mark. Great job. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, a great job, but. <laughs> you did we'll, good. Um, on the UI side, when I look at Augur, there are a few things, and this kind of harkens to what Andy was saying earlier. So if I look at the left side, I see Augur dashboard, repos, workers, repo groups, explore insights and edit configuration. I honestly think if it's not being used, it shouldn't be there. Okay. That's so things like edit. Like, I just don't think at this point you want people to edit configuration too much. Yeah. And actually currently we just have yeah, just, a little message to contact someone directly. Um, yeah. Less is really good in these situations. Okay. Kind of, yeah, to be able to sort through the mess of things easier. Yep. And then on insights, like if I look at this page, you should say like insights colon. These are insights provided by Augur that represent anomalies that have occurred on particular activities in your repository. Something along those lines as to what an insight might be. Just okay. describe it at the top. Something a little more clear. Right where the gray meets the white, where it says insights. Yeah, yeah, I see what you mean. Yeah, that's a good point, too. If I click on workers, what would workers take me to? Uh, it takes you to, it, it just lets you know which workers and data collection uh, processes we have available. Is that helpful to me at all on the UI? I'm trying to think of like, I think when um, I start getting to this, maybe Andy could speak to this a little bit. Do you care about that? Personally, um, I think the best thing to do is 
is to try and at this point in time reduce the configurability and um, you know focus in on uh, let's say a couple of key audience members and just build hard-coded UIs that address exactly their needs. I think that'd be a really nice way of getting started that would allow folks to get out and, and show, um, you know, show screens, um, start collecting feedback, and then you can get feedback as to what people care about for configurability. Okay, yeah, that's too much configurability is a bad thing. Yeah, 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 I, I completely agree. And um, it's overwhelming. It is. And I don't, is your comparison manager working at all right now? Uh, it kind of depends on the instance. Let me check really quickly. I mean, configurability is awesome. It's just really hard. It just takes hard. a ton of time. And if it's, if there are a ton of configuration options, lots of times you don't know how to pair those to actually make sense in any meaningful way. Yeah. I completely agree. Like one, one thing, okay, when I talk about hard coding, you know, an idea might be, for example, like a side-by-side -side project comparison, project A versus project B, hard coded list of, of you know, comparables, that would be, in my opinion, extremely interesting for, for people to see. Yeah. And, um, and uh, so the only configuration is what is project A and what is project B. Um, I, think you'd, I think you'd generate some interest with, with something like that. I mean, I think it could be off that list that like Jessica shared, which is commits per week, issue resolution time, just a lot of the activity metrics. Yeah, and and you could even okay if you if you if you you know wanted to branch out a little bit more, you could say let's compare project A to project B in the risk domain. Let's compare project A to project B in the value domain. Let's compare project A to project B in the diversity domain. And so the the list of sort of comparable boxes would vary depending on what domain you are. And it would just be a way of comparing project A to project B, and that, that would be all it would do. And I think that'd be really cool. So I don't think your comparisons are working. I agree with Andy. I agree too, yeah. And um, yeah, maybe that's something we can incorporate into this page, kind of sort by working group metrics, kind of give a snippet into each of those uh, domains. Um, and yeah, like you were saying, I think that would appeal to uh, the use case Jessica was mentioning. Mm -hmm. uh, being able to, when someone's choosing between projects for something, just kind of getting the important snippets from all over. So yeah, I, I definitely agree. You know, that, that could be all Augur is for the first release. And in my opinion, that'd be really useful to lots of people. Oh gosh, I mean, if, if Augur kind of had a, if you would just simply have a, repo, a single repository view of the risk metrics as you already have, a single repository view of evolution metrics and value metrics, I mean, honestly, and, and then the ability to compare within those domains, I mean, that would, that'd be huge. And, and you have the guidelines from the chaos project for the metrics. You have the endpoints built, even if you do it statically or dynamically. Um, just that simple. Like you click on the risk button and you just see the risk metrics, just like what you already have. And then if I'm in there, I just want to compare against another project. I mean, I think this is kind of where you guys are going anyway. Um, this is a little bit more than, <laughs> than what you asked, Carter. Yours was no, more, no, no, uh, that's totally fine. It's great feedback. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it's as simple as is identifying a repository, at least to me. And you provide information on the chaos working group metrics as defined by the group. And just use those. You don't even have to go much beyond those. 
um, and then allow people to compare around those. Mm -hmm. yeah. So the, the first first level is define the the repo. The second level is display the metrics associated with the working groups for that repo. And the third level is to compare those exact same metrics with another project. And insights is great too. I don't think you have to get rid of things like insights. I don't think you have to get rid of things like, um, like the peep, the facade stuff. Mm -hmm. Those, those are really great too. Those are great, great views into the picture. And in fact, that could be maybe the overview page, right? So you have these insights and down below, you just have the the facade stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So every every project essentially then has um, one, two, three, four. It, it has kind of this overview page, which is insights and the people who are contributing. A repository has a risk page. A repository has a value page. It has an evolution page. And it has a diversity and inclusion page. Mm -hmm. So it has five pages total. This page that I'm kind of seeing here with the people and then a page for each working group. And then I think it's within the working groups that you can provide comparisons. When I'm in the evolution page of a, of a project, say I'm in the evolution page of Vega and I want to compare it to something else, it's right there that I can do the comparison. Yeah, yeah. Okay, definitely, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I do know we are six minutes over. Yeah, yeah. We'll let you guys get back to your lives but thank you guys for all the feedback today it's been thank you it's yeah, very helpful we've got a lot of stuff that we can that we can work on we appreciate it yeah, right. and, and by the way uh what you have here really looks good yeah, yeah. totally agree so um you know i, I really want to emphasize that i think the work you guys are doing is marvelous thank you thank you guys we, appreciate we, we'd like to think so too <laughs> yeah no it's it's awesome and the things that you're doing are are great and um, thanks for thanks for the demo today. Yeah, of course. For sure. Thank you guys. Yeah. See you guys. See you, Andy. Bye. See ya.